The date, February 5th, 1988. The location, Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana. Man, Market Square Arena, that's a flashback from the past. February 5th, 1988. Friday night. The event, it was called the main event. WWF's Friday night version of Saturday night's main event. And I know on that day back in 1988 as a six, soon to be seven year old kid, I did what 33 million other people did. And again, I'm going to emphasize that number. 33 million people tuned in to watch via their television screens. 33 million people. At the time and still to this day, the single most watched professional wrestling event in the United States. 33 million people. That is an astounding number. And you think back to the height of the WWF during the Attitude Era, where they're getting 7, 8, and sometimes 9 million people to watch segments or watch an entire show, Halftime Heat doing 8 million people. The main event, February 5th, 1988, did like, I think it was a 15.1 share, 33 million viewers tuning in to see the biggest WWF title rematch in history, Hulk Hogan defending against Andre the Giant. And the reason it was called the biggest title rematch in history was because it was, and it still is to this day. When you talk about the height of the WWF, you talk about this time period. 33 million people. That is an insane number. 33 million to watch professional wrestling. And not even like great in-ring action professional wrestling. WWF, 80s, cartoonish, kiddish, characters, personalities wrestling. When you want to talk about the greatness of professional wrestling and you want to talk about the greatness of the WWF, at this time, this show encapsulates it. You didn't have the best in-ring action. Instead, what you had were the larger-than-life personalities, these monstrous characters, these great mic workers. You had so many things, great stories, just everything about it, great commentary. I mean, when you go back and you watch this event, as you should, as you most certainly should, especially if you have never seen it before, when you want to sit there and knock on somebody like me for marking out about the 80s in WWF, you go back and you watch the show and you understand why. And keep in mind that while all your guys today do stupid flips and kicks for nothing with no purpose, no meaning, no reason, this company used to be able to do something like this and get that many people to watch on a Friday night, not even what is traditionally a strong ratings night like Monday through Thursday night. This was a Friday night. Just insane. But you go back, the commentary team, it was Vince McMahon, it was Jesse the Body Ventura. They had tremendous, tremendous on-screen chemistry. And while I know we talk about other legendary commentary teams of that time for the company, such as Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura, and most certainly Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan, the one tandem that always I feel like gets underrated and underappreciated is Vince McMahon and Jesse the Body Ventura, because at this time, Vince McMahon is the owner, but you don't talk about it. Vince McMahon is the guy calling the shots, but you don't really acknowledge that on camera. He is the representation for the good guys. He is the representation of right versus wrong. He is the representation of so many millions of wrestling fans that watch the WWF. We want to see the good guys win and the bad guys lose, and play by the rules and so forth. And then you have Jesse the Body Ventura, 
the epitome of great heel commentators. And in particular, when you're talking about him and Hogan and the real-life heat and animosity that was there, mostly from the part of Jesse the Body Ventura, it works so incredibly well when trying to tell the story of Hogan versus Andre because not only was Jesse the Body Ventura acting like a heel, getting the heat on Andre, getting the heat on the Million Dollar Man, and trying to get the shine on the babyface Hogan, he legitimately didn't like Hogan. So it was real. And when you go back and watch it now, especially through the scope of history, you can gain a greater appreciation for it. You're like, man, he really doesn't like Hogan. He calls out Hogan on his crap. What about the rake to the eyes, McMahon? I mean, just classic stuff. But when you go back and watch this show, it's crazy, man, when you think about it. That was the type of impact wrestling could have. That was the type of following that wrestling could have. And when anybody ever talks to you about the biggest names in the history of the business, and they'll throw out guys like Austin and The Rock, there is no question. They are megastars. They are all-timers. They were massive draws. But they take a significant back seat and can kick freaking rocks compared to Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. You're talking about Hogan and Andre between that span of 87 and 88 when they were feuding. You drew over 90,000 people to the Silverdome. No matter how much Meltzer tries to tell you they didn't, they did. They created the Survivor Series concept, a pay-per-view concept over 30 years later that still exists today, launched off of the backs of the Hogan and Andre story. Not to mention, the 88 Royal Rumble was largely created to have the contract signing between Hogan and Andre for their rematch here at the main event. That's how the Royal Rumble came to be, because of Hogan and Andre. Survivor Series came to be because of Hogan and Andre. Later on in this summer of 88, you got SummerSlam, which was created because of Hogan and Andre. So at the time and for years, you had the biggest house you ever had for one of your events because of Hogan Andre. You created your other three big four pay-per-views off of the backs of Hogan and Andre. The two biggest stars, not named Vince McMahon, in the history of the WWF slash E, and the two biggest money draws in terms of talent the company has ever had or will ever have, and if you don't like it, you can eat shit because it's 100% true. When you want to sit there and talk about your favorites getting 33 million people to watch them on television, then come holler at your boy. In the meantime, sit down and learn a little bit of history here. But enough about that and the regaling of the days gone by where steroids were plenty and the cocaine was flowing like the booger sugar should. Talking about this show. You know, you know it's Hogan and Andre. But what a lot of people forget about was there was an intercontinental title match here between the Macho Man Randy Savage and the Honky Talk Man. Two of the greatest intercontinental champions of all time. And the whole premise of this story was so simple it was genius. Honky had the hots for Miss Elizabeth. Honky wanted Miss Elizabeth. Everything he was going to do was all about Miss Elizabeth. And meanwhile, Macho Man, now having turned face, deep down, cared tremendously for Miss Elizabeth, was protective and kind of crazy about Miss Elizabeth, and sure as hell wasn't going to let anything happen to Miss Elizabeth on his watch. And that was the entire premise of this match. No, if you're a younger fan, maybe 25 or younger, maybe this is not the type of match that resonates with you. Maybe this is not the type of match that you look at and say, man, I could be really entertained by this. And you know what? I get it. Because you've been so removed from emotional storylines, you've been so removed from what actual real true emotional investment is, that you have to survive on the pure in-ring action. But that's not what this match is about. This match is about... You can bump if you want to, but if you really don't have to, why do you need to, and why the hell should you? This match was tremendous for what it was, and think about it for these guys, knowing that they're going out there in front of a massive audience. They went out there, and they put on a show for what type of match it was supposed to be. Yes, this is the type of wrestling that I gravitate to. This is the type of wrestling I feel like is best. This is the type of wrestling I feel like could still work and would still work in today's professional wrestling world. You've got smaller guys, yes, great athletes, absolutely. 
if we could get those type of stories that could connect with the audience that are so easy to understand, like Honky and Savage and everything revolving around Miss Elizabeth, man, you'd have something. You'd really have something. But this match was just a blast of fun for me going back and watching it yet again. And my hat's off to the Honky Tonk Man and the Macho Man Randy Savage for doing this type of match and working this match in this type of way, where it ultimately leads to Macho winning but not getting the title, but he has saved the day and he has protected Miss Elizabeth. Sometimes wrestling doesn't have to be rocket science. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The old motto of KISS, keep it simple stupid, can be still incredibly appropriate even in today's world. But you go back and you watch Miss Elizabeth like she was the queen of professional wrestling. She was that lady. She was that woman. And, you know, even going back and watching all these years later, I still get a little emotional, frankly, watching Miss Elizabeth and realizing that she's no longer with us. Because as a kid, I mean, I loved Miss Elizabeth. And I know I'm not the only one. But even with this match and how much fun this was, it was all about... Andre and Hogan and Andre's allegiance now to the million dollar man Ted DiBiase as you watch this show you got two everybody that was involved that mattered got mic time they got promo time and even when they were having some technical difficulties switching between the commentators out there and shutting off the noise from the crowd to get to the guys cutting their promos in the back, it still got the point across. And I miss these days when you presented it like this. You kick off the main event or Saturday night's main event, and I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this, brother. Man, honky talk man and macho cutting promos, sign me up. The million dollar man with Andre standing behind him just doing this weird squeezing motion. And then Hogan in all of his roided cocaine excellence saying, I'm coming for you, brother. Just fucking phenomenal. But the match itself. Look, I'll be the first to admit, the Hogan and Andre matches are most certainly not going to be showcases of professional wrestling, no matter what your taste or no matter what your appeal. That is unequivocally true. And in the grand scheme of things, who gives two shits? If you sit there and handshake each other and get 33 million people to watch, then that is how it should be done. Because ultimately, this is a business. This is about getting the biggest audience you can and making the most money you can. And nobody ever got bigger audiences than Hogan and Andre, period. Like, this is not even a debate. This is not even up for discussion. So you're looking at this match. And Hogan has been the champ since January of 1984. January of 1984. What was it January 23, 1984? Hulkamania was born, brother. So he's been the champion over four damn years. When you talk about taking the ball and running with it and putting a company on your back, that's what Hogan did. Four plus years as a champion. You'll never have that again. Nor could you have that again. And part of that is because of the short attention spans that we have in our society today. The increased exposure of the product. You couldn't, you're couldn't. lucky to get by with a year-long title reign without that getting drugged through the mud. But four years, four freaking years! Hogan was the guy. Hogan was the champ. And think about this. You're going into this with the Golden Goose, who you've done all this massive business with. 30 plus million people watching at home prime time on a Friday night before the days of the internet or anything like that. And you're going to take this opportunity, this moment in time to take that belt off of Hogan. All to set up to that tournament at WrestleMania 4. When we talk about Vince McMahon and people talk about Vince having nuts, Vince having the guts, Vince having the balls the size of great fruits. To do things that nobody else would do. I promise you, in his situation, there would be no promoter alive that would be willing to take enough of a risk to sit there and take the belt off of his four plus year champion that you've done all this record business, you've taken over the world of professional wrestling, 
And you're going to use this opportunity to take the belt off of him at this time in this way. Two Dave Hebners, you want to talk about, still to this day, one of the truly great creative finishes in WWF slash E history. This is it. Everything about this worked. Andre's moved on from Heenan. He's with DiBiase now because DiBiase, well, at least on this show anyways, DiBiase's got the money. And the money makes the man, and money can buy happiness, and money can buy you everything, including the biggest wonder, the eighth wonder of the world, Andre the freaking Giant! Against the ultimate 1980s vanilla, red, white, and blue, all-American babyface and Hulk Hogan. Like, everything about this was magnificent. And you're going to take this opportunity... To take the belt off of Hogan with a screw job finish in front of 33 million television viewers and a sold out Market Square Arena crowd. After everything that you've done with Hogan over four plus years with him as the champion, this is how you're getting the belt off of him. This is how you're setting up to WrestleMania 4. My God, it was brilliant. It was genius. Match quality, my ass. It does not matter. What does matter is, though, is that in front of the largest television audience that professional wrestling ever had, Vince McMahon decided this was the time to take his title off of, at that time, the most successful world champion financially in any company in the history of professional wrestling. That is balls. Because what happens if it doesn't work? What happens if the fans shit on it? What hands, happens if the fans resent it? What happens if the fans say, that's enough for me? All of those things potentially at risk. You have the great uncertainty of knowing you're going to be transitioning off of Hogan to somebody else, in this case, Macho Man, which is why he was showcased here, because you wanted people to see what another different type of megastar looked like, and here he was right here. They took the belt off of freaking Hogan. And as a kid... I'm sitting there like, no, he, he, he got his shoulder up. He, no, that's cheating. He did not. And even Vince, like encapsulating what so many millions of kids like me were saying at home. No, he didn't. As Ventura sitting there, he won it. No, he didn't. He did. No, he didn't. He did. No, he didn't. <laughs> to be able to sit there and be the orchestrator of all of this. Being the guy that made that call, that took that shot, that took that gamble. And then being able to sell it as a commentator. Just absolutely magnificent. And the funny thing about this show is there's still another tag match that comes on afterwards that the television feed ultimately cut off in the middle of. To this day, I get so frustrated. I get worked. I get so emotional. As a fan, and like now, it's different because it's hilarious to me and it's awesome, but I still refuse to watch the rest of this show, even though I know I could go on the network or on YouTube and actually watch the entirety of this and watch the completion of that tag match. After that happened in 1988, I always promised myself I would never watch this show ever again. I lied. I watched it. I don't know how many times I continue to still watch the WWE to this day, 30 plus years later. But I stand firm on something. Whatever came after Hogan and Andre doesn't matter because like the rest of America, they weren't watching anymore. If you want an understanding of why people like me look back at the 80s in WWF and look back at it in such glowing terms, and why people like me aren't always that concerned about in-ring action and the physicality of what happens in the ring. This is the type of show, it's less than an hour long, that you need to go back and watch to give yourself some context of the history of professional wrestling. And specifically the history of the WWF, the WWE, and understanding where it's been and why it's so depressing for so many people like myself to see what the hell we get today. Magnificent show. 33 million people and you're taking the title off of your four-year most successful champion in history. That's insane.
and genius. And that was the main event, February 5th, 1988. 30 years ago. And you think about it, Savage is no longer with us. Andre is no longer with us. But the memories last forever. And this is truly one of my favorite, as much as it still works me up and gets the little Hulkster inside of me mad, still one of my favorite, favorite, absolute favorite WWF slash WWE events of all time, of all time, of all time, brother. So thanks for tuning in for this walk down memory lane, this retro wrestling review. Feel free to give your comments on this show and make suggestions for an upcoming retro wrestling review as this is the Schleg Daddy on the OTRS Central channel. Remember, not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And people try to sit there now and tell me about this guy's great or that guy's great. And they're lucky to get 3 million people to watch Raw. Hogan and Andre did 33 million. Suck on that, fat boys.